on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. In our last conversation, Mike, we were explaining that here in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, this was the place that Jesus made his base. And it's from here that he calls his disciples. It's certainly from here that many of them are called, and many of them seem to come from this particular area. One of the key ones, of course, will be the fishermen from this area who fished these local waters. I mean, as I look across, the wind is blowing a little bit, but the Sea of Galilee is metres away. Uh, It's a hot day. We're in the shade, fortunately. Um, But, yeah, the fishermen would have been active uh, right here. Yeah, and, you know, you said it's a hot day. It's, it's what, about 33, 34 degrees today, and you and I are feeling the heat. Imagine what it would be like to work as a fisherman out there in the boat. So these guys who Jesus called, many of them who were fishermen, you know, were hard-working men who would work those waters and whose hands would have been calloused from pulling on the nets and pulling on the ropes. So Jesus sort of comes from Nazareth, uh, up in the hills there, down to where we are by the Sea of Galilee. He's teaching in the synagogue, as we heard last time, and uh, sort of making ripples amongst the, the local population, if you like. The fishermen are getting on with their job and, you know, maybe not even aware of him. Yeah, but, you know, Jesus does what he often does. He breaks into people's lives. It's interesting how very early on in Mark's Gospel in chapter 1, uh, Mark tells this story of Jesus uh, breaking in in Mark chapter 1 and verse 16 says that as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon, Simon Peter that is, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me Jesus said and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. So, hey guys, um, you know, you're you're trying to catch fish at the moment. Come with me and I'll teach you how to catch people. It couldn't have been as instant as that. (laughs) Well, Mark summarises it in that way, doesn't he? But do you know what? I think the Gospels help us to see that there was something of a backstory to that, as there often is when people make a decision to follow Christ. For example, if we look back to John chapter 1, we find there that Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, was a follower of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, of course, now starts to point away from himself to Jesus. And Andrew goes to Peter and tells him that they've found the Messiah and then takes Peter to Jesus to meet him. By the way, in passing, that's still one of the best ways to share the gospel is through friendship, is through saying, hey, I've met this guy who's changed my life. Why don't you come and listen? Why don't you come and hear? So that's the very first step. And Jesus sees Peter for the first time in his life. And he says, huh, you're called Simon, but from now on, you're going to be called Kephas in Aramaic, or Peter, Petros in Greek, which is very like the word Petra, rock. So immediately he sees something in Peter. He sees destiny in him. I love how Jesus looks and sees what he sees in us long before we see anything in him. And he sees destiny in this guy. So that looks like it's the very first encounter. His his brother has taken him. And Jesus has given this sort of tantalizing vision for his life. Now, we're not told that he chose to follow Jesus at that moment. Maybe this is Jesus dropping a bit of a taster, as it were. In Luke chapter 5, there is one of my uh, favorite stories, which is the story of the miraculous catch of fish. And in fact, it's such a good story, I I think I might um, read it to us. Um, Luke chapter 5 uh, is the story of how Jesus calls his first disciples. And it happens here, right where we are. 
One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, remember, Gennesaret was another name for this area, Sea of Galilee it is, with the people crowding round him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. They'd been out all night fishing. They've come back in the morning. What does a fisherman do? He washes his nets clean from any muck that's got gathered in them, repairs them if necessary. So that's what they're doing after a hard night's fishing. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter. And he asked him to push the boat out a little from the shore. Then he sat down like rabbis did and taught the people from the boat. In other words, it's getting a bit crowded down there by the shore where we are. So he asked if he can borrow Peter's boat as a floating pulpit. Now, when he finished speaking, so he's done his teaching, he said to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, actually, he's pretty sarcastic in the original Greek. Simon answered, master. It's not the normal word for master. It's perhaps what we might say today is, okay, boss. <laughs> you carpenter, you rabbi who knows so much about fishing. Okay, boss. You know, we've worked hard all night and done our thing. But because you say so, I'll try it. Well, when they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. Often they would have two boats with a dragnet between them. So they're calling over to the others. And they came and filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said... Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. So I can see the process that you're talking about there absolutely it wasn't just a hey leave your nets and follow me yeah i've got nothing better to do on a tuesday i'll come no there did definitely seem to be a backstory here that we get little glimpses into and i love that because i mean that's still the same today there are people who hear the gospel for the very first time and are just overcome by and respond but for most people they need to hear the news about jesus and what that means several times before it actually clicks and they're ready to respond to his call and to say, yes, Lord. Fascinating, isn't it? That I mean, who would have thought that a catch of fish could lead to conversion? It, you know, it's something really unusual. And when Peter falls on his knees and says, forgive me, Lord, I'm just a sinful man. What was it? It was like he touched something of the other, something of the beyond. He realized he was touching mystery and miracle here that he couldn't describe, he couldn't put into a box for all his religious education as a Jew over the years. I don't know everything about you yet, Jesus, but I've touched enough to know I need to respond. Still often the case today. You know, you do not need to have all your questions about God and Jesus answered. I still have questions after all these years. All you need is enough to be able to say, you may not know everything, but do you know enough to say, I'm going to give this a go. I am going to step out and follow this guy. I've heard enough to say, I don't know everything, but I know enough to say, I want to follow him. And that looks like it's the process that Simon Peter went through himself. It certainly doesn't look as if he was responding in a kind of emotional way in a meeting stirred up by an inspirational speaker. No, I mean, it looks, if you look, there's, there's different things. When... His brother first comes to him, if you like, there's, there's theological explanation. He, his brother says, I think we found Messiah. Now he's a good Jew, he would have known about Messiah, been looking forward to Messiah. On the other hand, there's 
there's an encounter. Very often people need to encounter God in some tangible way and he touched him in some way. But it's certainly not an emotional response at the moment. There's, there's thinking, there's seeing, there's stepping out and all of this comes together just metres away from where we are now on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And close by as well, and we mentioned this last time, Peter's mother-in-law's house, the site of, that's what we're looking at, this flying saucer-shaped building. Uh, Just explain again about that, and and then obviously the connection with Peter and his mother-in-law, the fact that he was married, obviously. Yeah, I I have to say, as I said in the previous episode, it is one of my least favourite aspects of this site, because it seems such an incongruity, this modern sort of flying saucer hovering over... um, what was Peter's mother-in-law's house. Now, probably let's just read one scripture and and then I'll read that. So Jesus is here in Capernaum. He's been teaching here in this synagogue behind us. He's uh, freed a man from an evil spirit in that. And Mark 1.29 says that as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon, Peter and Andrew. And it's what? Just a matter of metres away from the front of the synagogue there. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. And that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. And the whole town gathered at the door, not at the door of the synagogue now, but at the door of Peter's mother-in-law. And Jesus healed many who got various diseases and so on. So not only does the synagogue become an important base, as we saw in a previous episode, actually home becomes an important base. Interesting that in our own time, homes have once again become important bases when you think of small groups that happen in churches, the number of alpha courses that have happened around the world based in homes. Homes can be a really important place for sharing the gospel. And just over there, Peter's mother-in-law's home, it looks like out of sheer gratitude for the miracle that Jesus did in raising her, she said, you're staying here, you're not going anywhere. This home is your home, my home is your home. Jesus, whenever you're back in town, come here. This is your base. And very quickly that site became a place that was venerated, honoured because of what had happened there, both sort of archaeological and literary sources uh, give us evidence that from the earliest days of the church, um, this place was venerated. How do we know? Well, a number of things happened. First of all, the, the house itself Uh, its function clearly changed because, well, little things like it was plastered over completely. That was really rare for a home in those days. It was only like special halls that would have been plastered over. The pottery that was discovered in the house, which previously had been pottery of things like, you know, cooking pots and jars, suddenly become instead entirely large storage jars for water and oil lamps. So again, suggesting it was becoming more of a public meeting place rather than a home. By the second century, um, it is definitely becoming a place of visitation for Christians. Uh, They found second century graffiti actually scratched into the walls saying things like, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, help your servant or Christ have mercy on me. And what started out there is a very simple church whose stone remains are still there at the heart of the site, survived for more than 300 years before it was eventually replaced in the 5th century AD by an octagonal church. And you can see those octagonal walls today and then another octagon outside of it. So all of that shows us that from the earliest times that place was venerated as a special place for Christians and it was venerated because it was the place where Jesus made his base in what was originally Peter's mother-in-law's home. Looks like Peter moved away eventually from nearby Bethsaida and relocated here and became part of his mother's extended family. So just meters away from us underneath that 
flying saucer <laughs> was the home where Jesus would have made his base and where he did so much teaching and healing. And where his call on Peter's life had such an impact to the extent that Peter was clearly going to go on and leave behind his, his wife, presumably, and certainly his mother-in-law. Yeah, fascinating, isn't it? You know, the very fact that he had a mother-in-law flags up exactly what you're saying. He, he had a wife. Um, in fact, in one of his letters, Paul says, don't I have the right to be accompanied by a wife like Peter and the other apostles? So the first apostles were married. Paul was either a widow or someone who'd chosen to stay single. But the other apostles were married. There was no celibacy for those early apostles. So, yeah, he had a wife and he would have had to have been ready to leave his wife back when he went out on these mission trips with Jesus. And let's put it the other way as well. His wife would have been willing to let him go as well. You know, I'm so grateful that my wife over the years has released me to go and do many mission trips abroad while she stayed at home looking after our kids. I do want to just come back to the naming of Peter, the renaming of Peter by Jesus. You said that Jesus saw something in him. Mm. Does he see something in us in the same way? I mean, would he rename us? <laughs> well, he might not rename us literally, but I think he renames us in the spirit, as it were. Jesus always sees potential. You know, there's that great story of Michelangelo who carved that wonderful statue of David and he carved it from a slab of rock that everyone else had rejected. Why? Because there was a flaw in it. There was a crack in it at some point. And everyone thought, no, there's no point doing that. But he looked at this slab of rock and thought, I can see David in that. And that statue of David to this day, of course, he's slightly twisted to one side with his sling over his shoulder. And the twist comes because Michelangelo carved around that fault in the rock. So to everyone else, it was a rock. To Michelangelo, he already saw David. I love that picture because that's what happened with Jesus and Peter. He said, I know what you are. You're a fisherman. You're probably a bit of a Jack the Lad like most of them were in those days, but I see something better and bigger in you. And still to this day, Jesus sees things in us, things we don't even see in ourselves yet, things we wouldn't even imagine we might be or do. And this is the adventure and the excitement of following Jesus. You know, being a Christian is not about ticking certain religious boxes. Yes, I believe that, believe that, believe that, do that. It's a following. Jesus said to these early disciples, his call was, come, follow me and I will make you. Come, that's an invitation. Follow, that's a command. And I will make you, that's a promise. And when we will respond to the invitation, then the command of Jesus, and we'll follow him, we start out on an adventure that we could never have imagined. You know, for myself, I grew up in a poor working class home in what is now South Yorkshire, what used to be the West Riding of Yorkshire. And if you had told me when I was a young boy, one day, Mike, you will visit dozens and dozens of nations preaching God's word, teaching, lecturing, writing books. I'd have laughed at you as anyone would have done in my village. But Jesus saw something in me back then that I couldn't possibly have seen in myself. But how it came about was simply by my responding to that call, come, follow me, and I will make you. Still today, Jesus says to people, come, follow me, and I will make you. And if someone's listening to our program today and has never responded to that, go on, I dare you. Make today the day when you will say yes to that invitation and start the most exciting adventure of your life and let Jesus discover that, as it were, David inside the slab of rock in you. Peter wasn't the only one who had that encounter and for whom his life was changed forever. There was a group, the 12 apostles, that sort of were gathered around Jesus. Uh, who were they? Yeah, I mean, there was a whole number of them. So uh, from this area here, we've got Peter and then his brother Andrew, 
We've got the brothers James and John. We read about them in Mark chapter 1. Um, here also in this town is the tax collector, Matthew. Wow, what a change it must have been for him. I mean, he would have lived a pretty good life. Uh, he's described as a chief tax collector, which meant that he had other tax collectors beneath him because this was a wealthy town, a trading area, a border area. So a very, very different um, kind there of person. Uh, there's Bartholomew, or Nathaniel as he's called, who came from Cana and was brought to Jesus by Philip, with, with whom he's often linked. Um, if I just run through them, we've got Andrew, Bartholomew, James, the son of Alphaeus. We don't really know much about him. Uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, fishermen from here. Matthew, the tax collector I've referred to. Peter, we've spoken about. Philip, from just a few miles down the road. Uh, Bethsaida, who was a, a friend of Andrew, Philip, probably from a Greek background with a name like that. Um, Simon the Zealot, who were the Zealots? They were the revolutionaries who fought against Rome. And here is a man whose life is profoundly changed by Jesus and who realizes that real revolution comes not with a sword, but in a completely different way. There's this guy called Thaddeus, who's only mentioned a couple of times, don't really know anything about him, but Jesus knew him. There's Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas. We'll meet him later in the story. And of course, there's... Judas, the one who ended up betraying him. Now look at that whole list. You've got fishermen, you've got a tax collector, you've got people we don't know much about their background, you've got a zealot, you've got a guy who will end up betraying Jesus. I mean, can you imagine your pastor, your minister coming to you and saying, David, uh, I've got a small group I'd like you to lead. Here's this bunch of people. What a mixture. What a different group. You know, and I imagine there must have been lots of rubbing of corners in those conversations as they followed Jesus around because they wouldn't have just responded to the call of Jesus and instantly become holy. We know that. We know that from the Gospels. There were times when the sons of thunder, as they're called, the brothers, got angry with someone and said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven and have them all burnt up? Clearly there was a bit of character work still to do there. But Jesus takes this bunch, this group of 12 very diverse people, puts them together and says, we're going to learn how to do life together the Father's way. And fascinating that some of them have so many more column inches in the Bible than others. When you mentioned Thaddeus, hardly ever referenced. And yet, presumably in this group for Jesus, this 12, they were all equally important. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know... <laughs> Who knows what became of him and, and what he did. He certainly wasn't unimportant or he wouldn't have been there. And 12 was important for Jesus. Jesus didn't just pick, you know, some guys at random, how many shall I have? Oh yeah, 12. It was very significant. He was obviously reflecting how God had given 12 sons through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob with his 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. It's as if Jesus is saying to us, I am reforming Israel around myself, true Israel. An Israel that will start by being formed of Jews, but will spill out beyond that and reach out into the Gentile world. So his choice of 12 is very deliberate, very specific to communicate this idea of he is reforming the people of God. Now, not around the law, but around himself. And we don't have the details of how he called all of them, but they each had a calling, a sense of something, and it must have all come from an encounter with him. Yes, you know, and if we think wider than just these 12, because we get glimpses in the Gospels to other people who were called. Think of that well-known story of another tax collector, Zacchaeus, who climbed up a tree so he could get a good view of Jesus because he was a little guy and nobody would make way for him to see Jesus as he passed through Jericho. How did his call start? By Jesus passing the tree, stopping, looking up, seeing this little fella up there in the branches and saying, come on down, I've got to stay at your house for tea. Nobody would do that. Tax collectors were hated people. They were collaborators with Rome. And yet Jesus called him a call that starts with a, a self-invitation to dinner. 
So these calls happen in so many different ways. Sometimes they seem, yeah, pretty instant. Sometimes, like with Peter, it looks like there was a process that went on there. But all of them needed to hear that call. They needed to hear at some point Jesus saying, David, Mike, it's you I'm calling. This is not just a general call to humanity that I've come to do good to. I'm calling people. I'm calling individuals. I'm calling you, even people listening to us today. Jesus can be calling you right now. And the challenge is, will you let it pass by? Maybe again? Or will you do what these people did? and start out the biggest adventure in life in saying, yes, Lord, I choose to follow you. I get the impression from you that to be called, to have a calling, a sense of calling, is not like perhaps a vicar or priest might have. This is, this is something for, for everyone, potentially. But maybe just explain it a little bit more, because, you know, perhaps a lot of us just drift through life and uh, don't always have a sense of a call. Yeah, do you know what? I don't think we've helped ourselves in the church in a sense by making special callings. There's a, a calling that is of a whole different quality and type and kind to be a priest or a minister or a full-time evangelist. I do believe Jesus calls people to specific roles and ministries. But I think it's more helpful if we think of there is a call for all of us, but we are called to different things. So some people are called to give their lives to being a pastor or a minister. Others are called to being faithful as a teacher in their school or as a worker in their factory or as a sweeper of streets in their town. Each of those can be a calling from God in the sense of Jesus saying, listen, this is not just a job. This is not just about you earning money. I want to put you in the place where you can influence and where you can make a difference. And that, what I think a call is, there's that initial call of responding to Jesus and saying, yes, the adventure begins. But then as we say yes each day and follow him, he leads us into particular areas. And sometimes we find that we're really fruitful in one area in particular. So I do feel that God called me many years ago to be a Bible teacher. The interesting thing is, I wanted to be a teacher from even before when I was a Christian. There was something in me, just wanted to be a school teacher. And there was clearly a gift God had put in me long before I understood what that gift was for. But he took it, refined it, shaped it, and made it what he wanted it to be. And that can be true for each one of us. But you say he calls us to a life of adventure, but it's not going to be a bed of roses. It wasn't for those 12 apostles and more. Absolutely not. It is adventure. And the thing about adventure is you don't know what's coming next, of course. And for some of these guys, their, their life would end up in martyrdom. There's no doubt about that. Still happens for some Christians today. So the call to follow Jesus is not a call uh, to health, wealth, prosperity and life on a bed of roses ever hereafter. It's a call to obedience, to follow the Lord of life, knowing that he always knows best for us. He always has a plan for us and through us. And that plan might not always be easy, but it will always be wonderful and it will always be fruitful. Well, on this spot, not very far at all from the shore of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus called his first apostles, first disciples, Pray for us, Mike, as we reflect on the significance of call for us today. Lord Jesus, here by the Sea of Galilee, where you called so many of your first disciples, help us to be like them and to respond with eager hearts, whether it be in a moment or whether it be in a process, Help us not to keep putting off our yes, Lord, but to say yes to your call, yes to following you, yes to the adventure of having our life changed, yes to the adventure of letting you chisel away at the stone of our life to find the statue of David within us. 
Lord, your call is wonderful. Help us not to miss it, we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.